good afternoon to all of you. For me, it's exactly one o'clock and I'm just before lunch. So <laughs> it's interesting to see this time uh, change here. But first of all, let me try to share my presentation. Uh, yes, and let me see. Um, uh, yes, okay, share. And if I open it to the presentation mode, let's see how it works. Can you see that the slides are just going? Is it okay? Uh, yeah, we can see okay. the slides, but it's not full screen. We can see the slides, but it's not full uh -huh. screen. Okay, I think that now I have... Okay, now it will work, hopefully. Is it okay now? Yes, perfect. Okay, and I just... And does it uh, moves forward? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah, okay, perfect. Then now... Let's start. So first of all, uh, let me thank you for inviting me and joining this great conference. I think that this initiative is really promising and I'm very happy to be here and be part of this conference. Uh, as it was mentioned, I'm from Budapest, from Hungary, uh, and as a full-time lecturer, I'm at Ötvös Lorent University. I'm an associate professor there, you know, with the typical researchers and teaching um, practices, but I also have a kind of professional uh, practice. Usually I do consultations with the schools or teachers, or I'm involved into several projects concerning giftedness. Uh, the topic which I will share with you today uh, is positive psychology and its relation to gifted education. I really, let's say, fell in love with this topic uh, a few years ago because I really realized that as a researcher into motivation and the non-cognitive aspects of giftedness, I just realized how important some factors are that were a little bit kind of neglected or underestimated. And um, to put it short, it belongs to, you know, well-being, resilience or coping or just mindset, as it was mentioned by Kirsty theory before. Uh, so that's why I became quite engaged with the positive psychology. So first, I will share you a few basic um, uh, facts and figures about positive psychology. Uh, it's very brief history and why and how it can contribute to, to uh, education. And after that, I will show you the relationship between well-being and high performance. Uh, and of course, there will be some practices uh, about how you can enhance well-being. But let's say the second part or the one third of my uh, lecture will cover two interesting uh, research uh, results and two studies, which are about teacher well-being and student well-being. And I think that if we know these kind of facts and these findings, it can provide us provide us a nice way how we can um, facilitate well-being and how we can support students. So let's start with the basic things. Um, interestingly, uh, positive psychology can be dated back exactly to 2000 uh, when a famous and prominent article was published by Martin Seligman and Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. The second person is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, uh, is a, a, originally a Hungarian a researcher who um, emigrated to the United States but he, he speaks or he spoke um, Hungarian language. Unfortunately, he died a few years ago. So they published this article, which was a prominent article to introduce the basic concepts of positive psychology. And within this, they just emphasized, which was also published in this so-called positive manifesto, uh, that positive psychology is the scientific study of optimal human functioning, that aims to discover and promote the factors that allow individuals and communities to thrive. I think that if you just read this goal or this um, mission statement of positive psychology, it becomes perfectly clear how important it can be in an educational context and also in gifted education because it is about optimal human functioning and it is about striving and reaching uh, and, and fulfilling your potential. I think that these are also our goals. So um, we have a shared goal between positive psychology and the gifted education. 
Moreover, there is another famous kind of definition concerning positive psychology, and it was um, uh, defined by Christopher Peterson. And he says that positive psychology is a scientific approach to studying human thoughts, feelings, and behavior with a focus on strengths instead of weakness, building the good in life instead of repairing the bad, and taking the lives of people up to instead of focusing solely on moving those who are struggling up to normal. I just highlighted those uh, aspects of this definition, which would be extremely relevant in the gifted education um, uh, area as well, because you see here that it is a scientific approach. So it is not just like good advice or a lifestyle um, uh, kind of uh, counseling, but is, uh, it is scientific. It is based and focuses on strengths. And again, in gifted education, I think that we always focus on what is really good in someone and what are the high abilities or the high potentials uh, in someone. And also the third thing is that um, it aims to take the lives of people up to great. Again, it is closely related to high performance or great performance. So uh, just to put it short, I think that there is a shared goal between positive psychology and education and gifted education. That's why it can be a really relevant uh, approach to use um, uh, in this field. And let me show you, it is one of my favorite kind of metaphor concerning positive psychology, and it is the so-called sailboat metaphor. Uh, maybe you read some famous literature or poems which um, compares life or people's life to, to uh, a ship or a boat. Uh, and it is this metaphor is something like that. Just imagine that your life or people's life is a sailboat. And if there is a leak on this sailboat, let's call it weaknesses, problems, or maybe traumas, uh, this boat may sink. So you have to prevent uh, and to, to, um, uh, to repair this leak. So that's, let's say, the goal of traditional psychology, to do something with weaknesses, with problems, with deficits. But on the other hand, if you repair the weaknesses, this sailboat is just still stands. I mean, it doesn't go anywhere. That's why you have to use uh, the the sails to get the wind and it will move you forward to reach your goals. And within positive psychology, now I will focus on these strengths part. And of course, we admit that psychology has a lot to do with weaknesses. But on the other hand, we have to see that strengths uh, and the sails of uh, this sailboat are really important to help you to move forward and to reach your goal. Uh, uh, this um, this picture is just a very kind of simple um, uh, simple uh, vision of the sailboat metaphor. There is a more complicated one, and I don't uh, really have time to elaborate this metaphor. Um, but I have to tell you that it is on the internet, so you can just find it. Uh, and I think that this metaphor is very complex, and you see that uh, you can just. Uh, identify goals or wishes or other people or peers. So this metaphor is really a nice and complex one and shows you the relevant aspects or relevant elements of positive psychology that can be related to education. Concerning the background literature, let me show you the famous classical ones. I'm sure that most of you've heard about uh, Abraham Maslow, of course, um, or uh, Carl Rogers, they are really famous and acknowledged humanistic psychologists from the 1950s and 60s. And you may be also familiar with Viktor Frankl's works, you know, like uh, this is maybe one of the most famous one, The Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, and I just wanted to um, bring these uh, books here because they are, let's say, the forerunners of positive psychology. Because you may remember that within Maslow's theory, this self-actualization is on the top priorities within the higher the pyramid of hierarchies. It's on the top. And when we speak about this self-actualization, 
it is something or it can be somehow be a parallel concept to fulfilling your potential. Um, but concerning the concept of positive psychology, it is worth uh, highlighting the book from uh, Abraham Maslow and the Motivation and Personality One, because within this book, uh, this term positive psychology was first mentioned and it was published in 1956. So it is more than uh, 50 years old, which means that this term is not something brand new, but uh, in this new framework, uh, it was established in 2000. And of course, there uh, since 2000, there are so many interesting and relevant books about positive psychology. You can find them, you know, uh, on the internet and you can just buy them internationally. I think that they are quite uh, available because they are widespread and they are well known. But maybe it is more interesting for us to see some books and some publications which are about um about positive psychology within an educational context. And I'm really happy to share it with you that there are a growing number of great literature, but the problem is that most of them are in English. And even in, in, within Hungary, we struggle with that a little bit because most of our teachers don't, don't uh, speak English. Our native language is Hungarian. So we really have to make a hard effort to make them kind of available for Hungarian uh, teachers. But I think that we, we started to publish some Hungarian, you know, um, articles or uh, summaries or deliverables or things that can be used uh, with teachers. But it is a kind of difficulty. And, and I'm, I think that for you, it can be also a kind of challenge. But still, we are within the process. And these books and handbooks are a valuable uh, source for, for finding out our way to, 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 to bring this uh, approach to gifted education. So uh, if we go a little bit closer to the school context, I would like to show you an interesting um, research result, which can be, I would say, it is my personal um, mot motivation why I try to bring this approach more into the gifted education. So Martin Zeligman and his colleagues asked a very simple question from parents and teachers. And this simple question sounded like, uh, what do you most want for your children? It was just a general question. And he, they asked um, to, to give a few answers, just a few words, uh, that what is your wish? What would you really wish to your kids uh, in the future? And the answers were something like this, happiness, confidence, contentment, balance, good stuff, kindness, health, satisfaction. And interestingly, I also asked the same question from Hungarian teachers and parents, and no surprise, but the answers were very similar to these ones. So it may show or represent a kind of general attitude of parents and teachers uh, towards uh, their, the students and the children. On the other hand, I also asked them uh, that what do schools teach to students? What is they good at? Uh, what, what, what are they good at? Uh, what do they really teach the best? Uh, and, you know, the answer was, uh, if we think about what schools focus on, uh, the following answer just came. It was achievement, thinking skills, success, conformity, literacy, mathematics, discipline. So it is the answer for another question that what do schools offer to, uh, to students? And, you know, when I realized the discrepancy between these answers, it showed me that on the one hand, for the future wishes, People, parents and teachers mostly emphasize these kind of well-being things or happiness, concepts related to happiness and well-being. And on the other hand, when we skip, speak about schools offers, then we see that it is more about performance. And, you know, we are here as teachers and parents who are interested in gifted education. And I think that we all know that 
the solution is somewhere between the two, or there is a huge overlap between the two. We would really want to promote both well-being and both performance. Both are important and both can be an important goal for education. So um, as my personal kind of mission, I think that I would like to show that how these two things are interrelated, I mean, well-being and performance or high performance, and how they can enhance each other, which means that if you are okay, if, you feel, if you're feeling well, or if you, if you have good coping or resilience skills, whatever, then it will have an impact on your performance. But on the other hand, it is also true, I mean, vice versa, which means that a good performance or a success would uh, create a kind of positive feeling in you, a kind of um, feeling of self-efficacy or a kind of recognition. So it means that these two areas are quite interrelated and overlapping. But uh, as the focus today is on well-being <clears throat> and on the positive psychological aspects of gifted education, I will more focus on the well-being aspects. And let's see why. Uh, I would like to show you some key data on well-being. And I think that the data are really kind of surprising, or maybe we know that things are not getting, I mean, things are getting worse uh, concerning mental health. And, you know, after COVID, uh, all the numbers, um, I mean, the scores concerning mental health were kind of worsening. So let me just highlight a few numbers, uh, a few main findings, like uh, 9 million adolescents in Europe are dealing with mental health challenges, for example, data from uh, 2022. Or um, uh, concerning uh, teacher stress, we see that there is a huge stress uh, on teachers uh, resulting from marking, classroom management, heavy teaching load, or addressing parental concerns. Uh, or for example, just, just to highlight a few numbers, you see them here, that like 13% 30, of adolescents um, in EU countries feel lonely while at school. I think that it is also something that, that is worth mentioning. Or, or um, life satisfaction and self-rated health uh, among adolescents and particularly girls has been in decline. And interestingly, we also had this kind of interesting findings that girls have a really bad kind of self-esteem and satisfaction with life. And of course, what we all know, but now we have numbers and, and data on that, that the COVID pandemic has just worsened these kind of um, scores and there is a growing number um, of students with anxiety, depression and stress. So on the one hand, I just want to say that well-being topic is a general issue in an educational setting recently. It was always like this, but in the past few years, we really see some kind of warning signs that we have to pay attention to that topic. On the other hand, and I think that it is also needed um, to mention that uh, more well-being or better well-being is related to better learning, uh, which means uh, what I just mentioned before, that um, increases in well-being are likely to produce increases in learning, which means that they, just to make it uh, simple, they go hand in hand. And there are lots of research results to uh, verify this uh, statement. Uh, just let me mention a few. Positive mood produces broader attention or more creative thinking or more holistic thinking, while negative mood produces narrower attention. Most of these findings, which show the uh, relationship between well-being and learning, can be explained by the so-called broaden and build theory, which was proposed by Barbara Fredrickson, uh, let's say a few years ago, or 10 years ago. And this broaden and build theory is really um, impressive because it shows how positive emotions may play a role in the learning process. And you know, usually we kind of differentiate between the two. We say that, okay, there are emotions and there is hard work on the other hand, but it is not really, uh, not really always the, um, not really uh, 
true because we see that positive emotions may broaden and expand our inventory of thoughts and actions. It may build or develop physical, mental, and social resources, and it would lead to a kind of transformation, advances in personal growth, and creates more positive emotions. And the whole circle just starts again, which means that uh, having positive emotions within an educational setting will lead to better learning. And it is kind of proven. So that is maybe the basic concept which uh, explains it clearly how this positive uh, mood can be related to uh, to, to, to high performance, a good performance. And actually she has lots of research results and also books which are available. So I really encourage you to, to check these results. And I would like to just mention one recent publication. It is not perfectly related to um, gifted education, but I just want to show you because I love it so much. And I would say that it, it was the document I was waiting for um, for, for years, let's say. And it was just published uh, just a few months ago uh, in June of fresh. Um, and it you can just check it on the internet. And the title is Wellbeing and Mental Health at School. And uh, it, it is a guideline for, for school leaders, teachers, and educators. And uh, the interesting within this book is that it doesn't, I mean, of course, it is a psychological or ed educational and pedagogically based uh, document, but it focuses on a whole school approach which is really kind of my favorite. So it doesn't speak about the individuals themselves, but how schools in general can kind of embrace this kind of mental health approach. And I think that this is really the way for future uh, well-being programs. So now I'm, I'm working with this, um, uh, with this working group and we will really try to find a good place for this approach within the Hungarian educational context. So I just want to uh, recommend it also to you just to go through this uh, document. Okay, so let's speak about a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more about well-being, uh, or I, I, would may, I would call it happiness or well-being. Uh, there is uh, the APA dictionary. The APA is the uh, American Psychological Association. And this dictionary defines um, uh, psychological concepts in a very clear way. And it says, this psychological dictionary says that it is, I mean, well-being is a state of happiness and contentment with low levels of distress, overall good physical and mental health, or good quality of life. Um, it is a very simple um, and um, a, a, a kind of simple uh, definition of happiness. And it is good for kind of research and good for understanding the basic uh, ideas uh, behind the well-being. Uh, but recent um, well-being models are more kind of detailed in a way that they, they try to um, analyze its elements. So usually we say that well-being, yeah, it can be understood like this, but it is more easy, it is easier to kind of develop or it is easier to, to put in it into education if we apply a little bit more complex models. And I will show you two complex models. The first is maybe maybe the most popular one. It is, you may, uh, this name uh, would be kind of um, familiar for you now because it is Martin Seligman, the famous one who can be called the founding father um, of this uh, approach, the positive psychological approach. And he published a book in 2011, where he introduced the so-called PERMA model of uh, well-being. And the PERMA is an acronym, and it stands for, I mean, the letters within it stands for uh, different words and concepts. The first is the P is for positive emotions. It is about yeah, emotions, experiences, or the, the lived uh, experience. 
The second is the E is for engagement. It is about the flow experiences. And again, I think that it's not difficult to, to combine the well-being elements to, to performance. And of course, with an engaged uh, activity and with a feeling of flow, we can reach potentially a higher achievement. Relationship is for the R. It is about connection to others. And again, we know how important relationships are both in our uh, everyday life and also within an educational setting. The M is for meaning and purpose. And let me tell you, let me admit that maybe it is my personal favorite because um, on the one hand, research has shown that meaning is maybe the most important factor that contributes to overall um, satisfaction with life. So all the elements are important, but meaning is the most important one. Why? because it gives a kind of framework for all your, your activities. And sometimes you, you may say, and you, you can also recall your own uh, experiences, that even through hard times, we can just um, uh, keep on if we know that there is a good purpose within that activity, or there is, if there is a meaning, there is a goal which we want to achieve, then we can be really perseverant. And that's why meaning is so important because it helps us through the, the difficult times. So that's why I, I really um, like it um, because it is very close to one of my research topics, which is resilience. So meaning is, is somehow central within this model too. And the letter A is for achievement about accomplishment and success. It is not a kind of objective um, assessment of, of achievement because there, there, there are no really objective assessments for that, but also a kind of subjective feeling of contentment, a subjective feeling of kind of satisfaction that, okay, I had my goals and I have reached those goals and, and I'm kind of um, satisfied with them. So... Um, this model by Martin Seligman gives us a really good guideline about how we can promote well-being within our students or, or within our children. And you see, and I think that it is a nice a proof that uh, performance has a strong uh, contribution to well-being. I think that engagement, flow, and achievement are kind of direct and explicit um, uh, contributions or connections between the two. But as I mentioned, meaning or goals or even positive emotions can be easily related to uh, high performance. Uh, this model, the so-called PERMA model, was um, applied many times in an educational setting. So if um, you would like to kind of establish a well-being uh, approach within your school, a kind of mental health uh, consciousness, then this model can be a really good starter. And just for, uh, for uh, an example... I would like to show you one uh, model that was based on uh, this PERMA uh, idea. And these are those elements that can be real kind of fields of intervention within um, educational setting. So you see that, for example, for positive emotions, we can include mindset and resilience or emotional regulation. Or I don't want to just read all of them aloud, but for example, for meaning, you can see here the importance of spirituality or purpose and passion or uh, post-traumatic growth. Or concerning achievement, for example, you can see the greed, perseverance or intrinsic motivation, hope and change theory. So there is a, a, a large number of really good psychological constructs, psychological concepts, which can be, I wouldn't say very easily, but still relatively easily applied within an educational context. Because this knowledge, what we already have, but we have to kind of change our own mindset. And if we see that, okay, our focus is on well-being, then these are nice ways to start with. And let me men mention just one uh, element of this model, what you see here, because it is not uh, five elements, but it is a six element model. And there is this vitality part. 
And uh, in the original uh, well-being model, in the original PERMA model, it is not included. So it was added later. And interestingly, it was added later through the practical uh, aspects of, of and, the, and through the application of this PERMA model, because it turned out, which is kind of straightforward, but still it was important to make it more conscious that physical um, well-being is also part of, of the holistic well-being. And let me just tell you that in Hungary, at least, the sleep and nutrition part is a really huge challenge within the adolescents. Um, and we know that the screen time and everything, I mean, there are so many other challenges which can be related to, for example, the lack of uh, enough sleep, but it is a huge uh, problem in Hungary. So it is a kind of uh, example about how you can implement a kind of well-being program or a mental health focused program within your school. And I think that they, you can again just see the relevance of well-being and the high performance or the overlapping between the two. But I would like to show you another good starting point. And maybe it is even better. <laughs> it is um, the so-called search model uh, from um, Leah Waters uh, and, and her colleague. And it is the search model. It stands for, again, an acronym, because you see here that it is the, the S, A, uh, E, and the other um, starting letters uh, are for the six main elements of this uh, model. And uh, this model is based on a very thorough and huge meta-analysis, which uh, analyzed the the impact and the effectiveness of several uh, positive psychological interventions. And as a result of this meta-analysis, it was found that these six main things, six elements are the best ones, which are, are I, mean, I mean, the effective ones that can be used in an educational setting. And that's why I think that the PERMA model is really good. That's a theoretical framework. But if you want to apply it in a practical way, then maybe this search model is even better because it is based on a, a meta-analysis and the study of effectiveness. So that's why I would highly recommend it to you. Um, Within strengths, there is the strengths awareness and strengths use and strengths spotting. You can see it on the publication, which is linked uh, just above uh, on, on the slide. Uh, within emotional management, there is uh, emotional intelligence and gratitude as parts of the intervention. Uh, within attention and awareness, there is meditation and mindfulness. Within relationships, uh, some mentoring um, programs are included. Within coping, it is the coping itself and resilience. And within habits and goals, it is self-regulated learning and, and um, goal-setting interventions. Um, I think that these topics would verse a whole session by themselves. So I will not go into details, into any of them, because I'm would like to give you a kind of holistic and overall view of these positive psychological uh, initiatives. But let me tell you that all these six elements would verse um, a, a full workshop because they, they may include not only theoretical knowledge, but lots and lots of practical you know, activities and things that you can do uh, with students. So maybe next time we can just go through them. Um, and uh, at, at the second part of my lecture, I would like to show you some recent research results, uh, which we have at the ELTE, ELTE is my university, Atos Lorand University in Budapest, because in the past few years, um, we have been involved into, into, into the research of this topic, because I think that data can be quite convincing for decision makers. So it honestly, I have to tell you that it's not just, I mean, um, these research results are not, uh, are just the result of my researchers' cr uh, curiosity, but I really try to find the good numbers and the relevant numbers that could convince school principals or even decision makers 
that it is a good way to, or and it is just necessary to implement the positive psychological approach into the educational uh, context. Okay, so um, uh, maybe you, you see that we have lots of research about the character strengths and the strengths and the well being um, issues. We also have something about future orientedness and goal setting. Uh, this VIA Youth Questionnaire is a questionnaire to measure uh, character strengths within um, younger uh, students. We also examine character strengths interventions for students and for teachers as well, which is, you know, it was very... Uh, had to say, we, we've learned a lot from that because, you know, setting up an intervention <clears throat> and a study of effectiveness is always kind of demanding. <clears throat> I've also created some and developed some e-learning materials for positive psychology. I would like to make it um, available for for not because now I have it in Hungarian, but I would like to make them make them available in English as well. So hopefully next time I can just show it to you as well. Um, we have some research results about teacher well-being, character strengths, and how it can prevent burnout. And finally. <clears throat> We have a recent research about mapping the well-being of students. And I would like to mention these latter two because um, we have some interesting results. And I just wanted to see that, wanted to show you that there we have something about teachers and also something about students. So first, let's uh, focus on teachers and teacher well-being. Um, I don't know what the situation is in your country, but uh, I've read some numbers from, from the United States and also from, from Europe, and they are quite similar to the Hungarian situation, which means that there is, just to put it short, there is a teacher shortage in our country. Um, and the rate of loss of early career teachers in many countries is approximately 40 or 50 percent within the first five years of teaching. That's a huge loss. Or um, in a recent uh, poll uh, research uh, from the United States, it can be concluded that 55 percent of teachers say that they will leave teaching sooner than they had originally pr uh, planned. And it's a huge number that 90% of them said that they are feeling bur that that no that bur burnout is a serious problem maybe not personally for them but in general and if we just go a little bit deeper into the literature uh, there are again i just want to want to read them aloud but there is a number of uh, research data that show that well-being and burnout are related and well-being can be a protective factor against burnout. They are in an inverse proportional relationship. So better well-being, lower burnout. That's sure. And these are just the, the publications. And which is more interesting that the use of strengths, the recognition and the use of personal strengths are also in relation to burnout. And using strengths leads to increased well-being and decreased burnout. And that was the main idea of our research, that we know that burnout is a huge problem. And if we want to set up a kind of intervention study or intervention for teacher uh, to prevent uh, teacher burnout, then it means that we could do something with, with well-being and also with character strengths. So the research of our goal was to explore the level, level of burnout among teachers in Hungary and to discover its relation to well-being and character strengths. But the ultimate goal was to establish a burnout prevention practice through positive psychological interventions, targeting workplace well-being and strength support. We had a um, sample of 264 uh, teachers. Um, and of course, the gender ratio is again, maybe quite similar than in most of other countries, that most of them were women. Uh, the average years of working was almost 23 years. And yes, you see that they were in elementary and in high school as, as well. We had some questionnaires. And the first questionnaire is about the VIA character strengths. 
And now we don't have time to go into details about that. There, is, there are uh, 24 character strengths, which are measured by this um, questionnaire. Then we, of course, measured workplace well-being and we measured burnout with some uh, questionnaires. And let me just highlight a very few results. The big thing here is that you see the, the bold uh, numbers that one third of the respondent teachers are in the risk or the high risk group uh, of teachers who show emotional exhaustion. And that's a huge number because it's not the moderate, but the high group. Uh, the others are kind of, I don't say they, they are good scores, but that is the most important one. And that's why later on, because the lack of time, I will focus on emotional exhaustion more, mostly because that's a huge um, threat uh, among Hungarian teachers. Um, here we see that what, what was kind of expected. So it is, I would say, no surprise, but still it is good to see the numbers that uh, the well-being uh, factors, like you see positive emotions, engagement, positive relationships, meaning and accomplishment, these are the elements of the PERMA model, are in the expected relationship with burnout factors. Of course, in a negative relationship with exhaustion and depersonalization, and of course, in a positive relationship with personal accomplishment. So that was kind of straightforward, but still uh, important to see. Uh, but if we go a little bit deeper and we see, you see the linear regression analysis, it shows us a more detailed picture and again, focusing on emotional exhaustion, that is, as, as I mentioned, the great problem in Hungary uh, uh, within the burnout topic, we see that positive emotions, engagement, and meaning are the ones that contribute to the highest to this emotional exhaustion. So what does it mean? That... Um, Oh yes, that is a. It is also a negative. I just I, I, the between meaning and emotional exhaustion. Of course, it's also a negative correlation. Um, and what we see is that uh, these three things, like positive emotions, engagement, and meaning, are good uh, intervention points to prevent emotional exhaustion. So that's one thing. And finally. Uh, we also examine, as I mentioned, character strengths. And it is also good to see that what kind of strengths are in um, a significant relationship and in a significant and a relatively huge uh, relationship with, um, with uh, burnout uh, areas. And again, what we see is that zest and vitality, hope and gratitude, these are highlighted in this kind of pink um, background, these three character strengths are the most important ones, uh, which has a huge impact on burnout factors. So what can we see? That if we want to set up a kind of burnout prevention um, um, program for teachers, these well-being aspects and these character strengths are the starting points. They are the most preventive factors. So as a kind of overall finding, we may say that teachers are uh, affected by emotional exhaustion the most. One third of them show the high level. Also, there is a significant negative connection between all aspects of workplace well-being and exhaustion, and also well-being and depersonalization. And of course, with a positive correl correlation between well-being and personal accomplishment. And also uh, emotional exhaustion is mostly influenced by the well-being factors of positive emotions and engagement, vitality and hope. And let's say a little bit less than half of the teachers answered yes to ever thinking about leaving teaching and mentioned as a main reason for that is lack of appreciation, low salaries, administrative difficulties and emotional challenges. So from this uh, research results, we can conclude that burnout is a huge threat among teachers, but we have some tools to prevent it. And these positive psychological approaches would give us a good guideline about how to cope with burnout challenges. 
So that's about teachers. And now let's see the students. Uh, because we also had a nice uh, research about how we can describe students' well being, social relationships, and attachment. And we applied a kind of environmental psychological approach as well. And as always, we wanted to connect somehow theory to practice. So we wanted to offer intervention opportunities to, to the schools. Uh, we conducted the research uh, in a um, kind of competent high school uh, in uh, Eastern Hungary. It was just one school, but practically we assessed all the students within that school. So it is also, I mean, it is an advantage and a disadvantage of this study as well. But as you will see, it, it had a reason behind that. Uh, and we used a mixed methodology approach, quantitative and qualitative assessment, with the questionnaires of well-being and social support and the positive and negative effectivity, the, and yet yeah, school attachment as well. And for the qualitative data, we used open questions, um, and it was just... Uh, what are the three things that you particularly like or dislike about your school? And we used a very kind of innovative method, which was the so-called reflexive photography, um, we, within which we asked students that for you, where is the place of happiness at school? And we asked them to upload a picture a photo, what they made, give it, give it a title and write a few sentences about that. Uh, it is a kind of um, environmental psychological approach um, and it reveals uh, subjective well-being according to the physical place. So what have we found? Again, it is something kind of straightforward. So I would say again, no surprise, but still important to see that uh, well-being uh, factors and well in the sum of well-being, so um, well-being in general, has uh, uh, is in relation to, of course, positive effect and at all, all the aspects. Of course, there are some higher numbers, some smaller ones, and of course, negative effects are in a negative correlation. I think that that's kind of okay. No surprise, but good to know. The other thing is, which was even more interesting for us, that, uh, you know, these, these are high school students between the age of like 14 and, and 18 or 19. And um, we saw that there is a huge drop or a huge decrease after the ninth grade. I, I don't know exactly why. And we really wanted to find because it doesn't really have a kind of developmental explanation. But we usually see, and that's that's the just a general uh, tendency, that the, the uh, students uh, in the ninth grade has a relatively good level of well-being and there is a huge drop uh, at the 10th grade then it, it gets a little bit better so we don't know exactly why uh, but still it gives us a kind of uh, sign that we have to pay attention to those students we have some explanations in mind i just don't want to <laughs> i don't have time for that we have some explanations for that but still it is something that the school should focus on. So that's why we can, when we try to give them kind of ideas for intervention, it is there that you should pay attention to the 10, 10 uh, grades. And maybe that's my favorite uh, <laughs> graph or my favorite figure, let's say, because it shows how positive and negative emotions are related to well-being and how does it impact uh, school performance. And, you know, these numbers can be really convincing for uh, principals, because usually if they come and see me and ask for consultation, usually their goal is to, to increase school performance. And if I say that, OK, we can speak about that, but let's see, on the other hand, the well-being uh, aspects, then these numbers are really, you know, kind of convincing to show them that if you want to increase high performance, then you should focus on um, well-being as well. And just a final and interesting example is about the reflexive photography. Uh, and I just show you it because, you know, it is an applied research. So what I show you here is not something that you can apply in your context within the same uh, setting, but still, um, 
I would like to show you that uh, these uh, we have this database like this. Uh, we asked this question that uh, for you, where is the place of happiness at school? And you see here the photos and you see here one short sentence that describes the photo. And then we see that it is a boy or a girl and whether she, he or she is in, in, in the, which grade, I mean, uh, here you see that she's in the 10th grade. And again, this is as well a nice uh, example of these um, of this database. And we see nice picture about uh, their places of well-being. And, you know, if they describe and um, go into details at why they feel uh, happy uh, in these places, then we can get a very clear picture about what is important to them and why and how we, we can enhance um, student well-being. So it was I would say it was fun to, to go through these pictures because it gives us a very good um, uh, picture about uh, their personal well-being. And we saw that satisfying psychological needs, interpersonal relationships, physical activities, recreation, teaching quality, and environmental characteristics were really uh, important here. And now I just skip this because of the lack of time, but uh, I will tell you that uh, from this research, we could just find that adolescents' well-being is largely related to their interpersonal relationships, social support, school attachment, and experience emotions. And the places associated with happiness can be located within the school building. So, finally, and as a summary to the whole lecture, I would like to tell uh, that uh, positive psychology has its place definitely in gifted education. I think that you now realize that how well-being and high performance are related to each other and how they can enhance each other. So achievement and well-being may go hand in hand and they should go hand in hand. And I would just want to refer to the original Zeligman study when he asked you know, teachers and parents to answer, to do different questions. And I think that now as a result of positive psychological approach, we can uh, just say that they can uh, appear together uh, within, um, within the educational setting. I also would like to say that well-being requires a kind of holistic approach if you want to uh, establish or uh, apply it within a school setting. Um, and we may use the PERMA model or the search model as well, but also I would like to again refer back to the document which was published recently, this whole school approach, because it is really a kind of mental health mindset to put it so, and that's what we should uh, um, apply. And finally, I showed you some research results, and it it was just a kind of example about uh, assessment uh, opportunities. But also, I would like to highlight that uh, if you have data, then you can uh, just point the fields of intervention, because it's not easy to always know what you can do, because there are so many opportunities. But if you have the numbers, then you know what are the positive or the advantages and the disadvantages of that given school. And as my last motto, <laughs> I would like to show it to you. And I refer back to, you know, the sailboat metaphor, which was there in the uh, in the lecture as well. And Louisa May Alcott said that I'm not afraid of storms for I'm learning how to sail my ship. So uh, that is my final kind of um, motto and final message to you. And I would like to thank you for your, um, for your cooperation and for your presence. And uh, we will not have time for that, uh, but um, I just prepared some questions for further thinking. So if you go home or if you go back to your place, you can think about um, the, these mental, the mental health issues among gifted students or about the search model. Or maybe the most interesting thing is that for you, what are the places of happiness within your own uh, workplace? So these are just interesting questions to the end. So thank you very much.